everybody. My name is Jason Mosley and I'm the CEO of IBIS. Welcome to our next instalment of Leading Lights. Today I'm delighted that we have with us BTAG Innovation, who are one of our closest global partners. We're going to hear from BTAG about how body shops can look at navigating the new normal and move on from all the challenges of the recent pandemic. We're going to take a look at a repair first ethos and how that can really help our business improvements. So please sit back and enjoy the Chief Operating Officer of BTAG, Dave Flockhart. My aim over the next 25 minutes or so is to provoke some thought about the changing dynamics in our industry, particularly at this unsettling time, and share some ideas which I believe can make a very positive impact on body shop performance to accelerate our return to prosperity. It certainly feels a bit dark and gloomy at the moment. Car count is down significantly. Many of us have had to make difficult decisions about reducing the size of our teams and most companies are having to manage a cash flow impact. But as an industry, we are good at dealing with challenges and have navigated choppy waters in the past. The good news is that vehicle movements are now starting to increase again, although some of the challenges created will be longer lasting. As the clouds start to clear, we essentially have two options, sit tight and hope things will return to normal or recognize the challenges and get into action to address them. Wayne Gretzky, who is regarded as one of the leading ice hockey players of his generation, attributed his success to skating to where the puck is going to be. The analogy has been used by a long line of business leaders since, and the purpose of this presentation is to encourage you to think about where the collision repair industry puck might be going, and as the sun starts to shine again, the actions to consider taking now to get there ahead of the pack. Technology cars including the materials used to make them and customers expectations have all changed enormously over the past 20 years but until fairly recently repair methods have failed to keep up this has started to change over the past five years or so with an increasing focus on the importance of following oem procedures leading to more investment in structural repair training and equipment this is as it should be and critical for ensuring safe and proper repairs but the investment cost is high and the associated return on investment presents a challenge for repairers because the proportion of structural repairs is in decline. In 2012, Thatcham Research predicted the widespread adoption of ADAS systems would cause a material change in accident damage distribution, with a significant swing towards smaller non-structural damage, which they predicted would account for 57% of the total by 2025. Fast forward to today, and Thatcham's prediction looks well-founded, and the trend looks set to continue. This pyramid is now typical of the work mix in most shops. The grey slice at the top represents small and medium-sized non-structural damage, which currently accounts for about 60% of the overall mix. Yellow represents total losses, and this percentage is also growing, in large part because of the cost of repairing the same technology that's helping to reduce the frequency and severity of collisions. It is also likely to be compounded by an increase in the average age of the car park over the coming couple of years as people defer new car purchases and reduce monthly expenditure by extending or restructuring existing finance terms. As the distance between cost of repair and value of vehicle narrows, the risk of repairs becoming uneconomical will grow. An increase in settlements also seems likely as drivers opt to accept cash payments rather than having their vehicle repaired, particularly if it's drivable. Understanding the current work mix in your business and how it's likely to continue to change are therefore critical when thinking about where the puck is going to be. Rightly, training focus has largely been on structural repairs. That's the blue bit of the pyramid. Without it, we risk not completing these types of repairs properly. But we have done very little with the grey bit, which not to be forgotten, accounts for the majority of the damage we repair in the shop. Going back to the point made earlier, because repair methods have not evolved at the same pace as the materials OEMs have started to use, 
we have increasingly allowed ourselves to replace panels that with the right knowledge and skills could be repaired in accordance with OEM standards. There is now compelling argument that our technician skills are no longer properly aligned with the work mix. If parts availability suffers because of supply chain issues and tighter credit limits imposed by suppliers, this will put a higher premium on repair skills. Equally, as the average age of the car park increases, panels that can be properly repaired rather than replaced could save a car from becoming a total loss. The focus on structural repairs has now also started to impact labour gross margins. In a recent conversation with the collision director of one of America's largest dealer-owned body shop groups, he said focus has tended to be on recruiting A technicians who already have the knowledge and skills to complete the structural repairs, that's the blue bit on the pyramid, rather than developing C and B level technicians to become proficient at the non-structural repairs, that's the grey bit on the pyramid. This is putting downward pressure on labour gross margin, which can now often be as low as 50% for some A technicians. Coupled with the real possibility of a shrinking technician talent pool, resulting from headcount reductions and leakage to other industries, development of less experienced technicians to align skill set with work mix presents an opportunity for shops to establish a competitive advantage and start to increase labour gross margins again. Taken together, it seems likely there will be increasing competition for repairable versus total loss vehicles going forwards and therefore a higher premium on repair skills. To prepare for this, collision centres must find ways to adapt and innovate to become much more proficient at non-structural repairs. To remember, that's the grey bit on the pyramid. Embracing a repair first ethos and focusing on the technical knowledge and skills needed to deliver it does this and creates an opportunity for repairers to boost gross margin by improving repair replace ratios and increasing touch time. I'm not suggesting this is the complete or only answer, but implemented thoughtfully, I think it is an initiative that should yield early benefits and long-term dividends. It is also one that has no downside and is relatively inexpensive to adopt. I would now like to focus on what I mean by embracing a repair first ethos and will try to qualify and quantify the potential benefits, starting with quality. Quality must always be the primary consideration at the outset, during the repair and at the end. As repairers, we are rightly held accountable for quality, so it's critical we consistently deliver properly on this commitment. That means needing to objectively determine whether a panel or part can be repaired or if it needs to be replaced. The key word here is objectively. Perhaps obviously, OEMs tend to document structural repair procedures a lot more comprehensively, but that's not to say there isn't clear guidance about what can and cannot be repaired when it comes to outer panels. If there's a clearly defined OEM procedure, it should be followed. In reality, though, it often falls to the repair planner or technician to use their judgment about whether a panel or part can be repaired or needs to be replaced using the OEM procedure for guidance. So here are four objective tests that estimators, damage assessors, repair planners and or technicians should apply to determine if a panel or part can be repaired properly. If all four of these factors can be restored in accordance with OEM specification, the panel or part is in scope for repair. But if any one of these factors cannot be restored properly, the panel or part must be replaced. Once the estimator or repair planner is satisfied about these points and has determined that the panel could be repaired or replaced, they should select the least invasive repair option. This is not just about cutting through factory welds or seams. It should also take account of refinish area to maintain as many of the original factory coatings as possible. Only after all of this has been determined should commercial considerations about efficiency, cost and profitability be brought into the decision-making process. To recap then, there is a clear three-step process with determinations being made about the most appropriate repair method in this order. Diligently applying these criteria should also help estimators or repair planners present a much more robust case for their chosen repair method and the associated cost to the customer and insurance partner. With quality determined, 
we can focus on the commercial factors associated with our repair replace decision and qualify how repair first has a positive impact on gross margin. There are two key factors to think about here, time and efficiency. Lots of factors affect repair time. Some are internal factors within our control as a repairer and others are external factors that are outside our control. This chart illustrates a 20 hour repair, which if completed over five days, implies a touch time of four hours per day or 50%. This is represented by the blue bars on the chart. By extension, this means the vehicle stands idle for four hours per day as well. This is sobering enough, but in some markets, cycle time, sometimes measured by length of rental, is longer than this and the average touch time per day even lower. I accept there are lots of variables to consider within these statistics, but taken in the round, they represent a huge opportunity for those businesses that can find ways to increase their average touch time. As I just said, a multitude of internal and external factors contribute to this inefficiency, which can be loosely grouped under three headings. The first is parts, for example, parts on back order, wrong parts ordered, wrong parts delivered, damaged parts delivered. The second centres on process inefficiency, whether on the part of the workshop or insurer granting approval to proceed. And the third revolves around estimator and technician skill set. I'm not suggesting we can realistically eradicate these issues, but neither are they completely beyond our control and we can certainly reduce their impact. For example, through effective estimator training, we should be able to improve the accuracy of the estimate and repair plan at the outset, reducing the need for supplements. And by arming technicians with the knowledge and skills to straighten today's outer panels, rather than having to replace them, we can mitigate the impact of some of the parts related issues. Doing this starts to change the picture to look more like this, enabling touch time to increase and cycle time to reduce. But what we're really playing for here, and to my mind, the most exciting opportunity is the additional capacity or shop space now created to fix the next car shown by the hatched area on this chart. This enables more production in the same workshop space and increases sales value per square foot. Now let's look at efficiency and how that can impact gross profit. To try to illustrate this simply, we use red apples to represent replacement labor hours and green apples to represent repair labor hours. The efficiency exchange rate for red and green apples varies between markets and as with the previous charts on repair time, I accept there are lots of variables which need to be taken into account. I'd therefore ask you not to take these figures literally and rather to think about them in the context of your own business and local market. The principle here is that a competent technician's efficiency on a repair labour hour, that's the green apples, is normally greater than for a replacement labour hour, that's the red apples. In this example, I have equated one replacement labour hour worked to one and a half invoiced labour hours and one repair labour hour worked to three invoiced repair labour hours. Using this exchange rate and based on an eight hour working day, if the technician is only selling red apples, we would be able to invoice for 12 red apples at the end of the day. Going back to the quality point, we will always have to sell some red apples, but if our technicians have the knowledge and skills to repair a couple of green apples alongside the red ones and our estimators or repair planners write green apples for repair, it has a meaningful positive impact on invoiced labour hours. Substituting two red apples for green ones enables us to invoice for 15 apples at the end of the day, nine red ones and six green ones, which is an increase of 25%. Above all else, each decision about a red apple or a green apple must be driven by the quality criteria discussed earlier. But thereafter, if we can find three or four green apples to sell each day, the potential reward is significant. I hope that explains how embracing a repair first ethos can have a positive impact on gross margin. So now let me try to quantify it. Before doing that, I'd like to reflect quickly on why gross margin is so important. Gross margin informs the gross profit generated from our sales, and gross profit is what pays the bills. Increasing the gross margin allows us to drive more gross profit from the same sales, or the same gross profit from lower sales. 
This is particularly important when there is less work volume. To quantify the impact a repair first ethos can have on gross margin, I've put together three different examples to explain it. The first centers on improving repair replace ratios. Conventional thinking suggests that improving your repair replace percentage by 10%, say from 50 to 55%, equates to an additional 3% of gross margin. Of course, that's not precise because it results from a blend of factors, including higher gross margins on labor versus parts, lower cost of paint and materials, and fewer empty steps in the process. For example, parts ordering, unboxing, checking, etc. The additional 3% this generates equates to $30,000 additional gross profit per million dollars of sales. So in the example shown, if a body shop makes monthly sales of $300,000 or 3.6 million per annum, that would equate to just over $100,000 in additional gross profit each year. Even more exciting, because this is just about working smarter, there is very little, if any, additional overhead cost to account for, meaning most of that additional gross profit goes straight to the bottom line. To keep the maths easy, I've assumed an operating profit margin before tax of 10%. For the same business with annual sales of 3.6 million per annum, that would be 360,000. Of the additional 108,000 of gross profit, let's say 80 falls to the bottom line. That would increase the net operating profit to 440,000 with a net margin of 12.2%. That's a 20% improvement in net operating profit. Another way to look at this is average touch time. Credit for this goes to our friends at Autohouse Technologies in Canada. Across their book of business, which is about 800 body shops in the US and Canada, evidence suggests that increasing your average touch time by 0.2 hours per day increases gross margin by 1%. We've already talked about the impact a repair first ethos can have on touch time. Taking a current average of 3.5 hours per day and increasing this to four would therefore equate to a 2.5% increase in gross margin. For reference, in the US and Canada today, body shops performing in the upper quartile have an average touch time of just under 3.5 hours per day. Four hours per day would put a body shop into the top 10%. Sticking with the North American market as a whole, the average is actually much closer to two hours per day. So consider the potential margin impact improving that to three or even three and a half hours a day would have. Lastly, I'd like to consider the impact of improving labor gross margin. As demand for A technicians has increased, so too has their pay, but labor rates have by and large remained relatively flat. This has squeezed the labor margin. Now consider what would happen if we develop a series of C and B technicians to focus on the non-structural damage we've been talking about. That's the gray bit of the damage pyramid. Aligning technicians' knowledge and skills with the actual work mix would mean less reliance on more expensive technicians in favor of competent but less expensive C and B technicians or even apprentices. The result of this blend of skills and labor rates would be a higher overall gross margin on labor. I think it would also serve to create a more clearly defined career development path, which could help attract people into our industry. So that's the theory behind why developing a repair first ethos can have such a positive impact on performance and help accelerate our return to prosperity. The how can be distilled down to two primary success factors. Firstly, there must be clear communication about what and why. This needs to run throughout the business from top to bottom and front to back. Secondly, it must be supported by effective training to ensure everybody from front office to back door has the necessary knowledge and skills to perform. Taken together, this drives alignment around the goal or objective, improving motivation, and by extension, employee retention. To give you a real world example of this, we have been working with AXA Insurance and a group of 100 or so independent repairers in Switzerland to embed a repair first ethos. Nearly two years in, the results have exceeded everyone's expectations, and there is consensus from all parties that internal communication between ownership, management, CSRs and technicians, external communication between body shop and customer, 
and effective training of estimators and technicians have been the key factors driving the success. To conclude, I have put together a list of suggested actions for you to consider. I love this quote, and I think it sums up the current situation perfectly. Going back to where we started, I encourage you to think about where the collision repair industry puck is going to be. If you think embracing a repair first ethos is part of the answer, there are five things I would encourage you to do. Firstly, look at your current data, including repair hours sold per technician, touch time, repair replace ratio, and sales per square foot. Confirm you understand your work mix and evaluate the knowledge and skills of your current team to make sure it's aligned with that work mix. Consider if your current pay plan is aligned with your objectives. And lastly, get in contact with BTAG to discuss how we can help you make it happen. Hi everybody and welcome back. Um, what a great presentation from BTAC. Some really interesting and thought-provoking elements to that. So I'm delighted now to be able to welcome Dave and um, discuss some of the aspects of the, uh, the presentation with him uh, and get his view. But first of all, hi Dave, how are you? Very well, thank you Jason. Thank you for great. having me. Pleasure. So Dave, you're uh, CEO, COO, Chief Operating Officer of BTAG. Just give us an overview of the sort of your role and, and what that involves and some of the things you do within BTAG. Well, as a company, we're very focused on developing the knowledge and skills of estimators and technicians, primarily to improve their performance within the body shop. Uh, so a large part of my time is spent um, developing uh, strategies to take that out into the market. Uh, North America has been a, a, a big strategic focus for us for the last eight years or so now, and, and uh, that's one of my primary responsibilities. Uh, one of the other things that we put a lot of uh, efforts and, and, and resource into is our BTAG Learning Centre, um, which we uh, have developed for both OEMs and, and uh, independent collision repair centres. Uh, and so I've also been um, leading the rollout of, of, of that programme uh, over the last couple of years. Okay. So you mentioned uh, the, the vehicle manufacturers, the OEMs. You, you obviously do a lot of work with the OEMs. Just give an example of uh, an OEM you work with and typically the things that you that you do with them. Well, um, we, we've always had a very strong focus on uh, outer panel repair. And as the materials uh, and the technologies used in vehicles have evolved over the last, particularly the last five or 10 years, uh, our work with OEMs has been about developing repair methods uh, to enable those uh, primarily outer panels to be repaired uh, properly and safely. Uh, and then uh, to take those techniques and, and um, translate them into the market um, so that repairers are actually you know, following those principles. Yeah. So your, your business is very much driven on uh, training and techniques following the OEM prescribed repair procedures and assisting in terms of maybe improving those repair procedures with the OEM, would that be a, a correct statement? Yeah, 100%. So quality is, uh, I mentioned in the presentation, quality is uh, number one, always no exceptions. Uh, so yeah. where there's a, a, an OEM procedure is you know, that informs the technician or the repair planner when they're uh, putting together the, um, the, the, the plan for the repair. Uh, that informs them how it needs to be done. The second element of that then is making sure that the technicians have the knowledge and skills to be able to execute on that properly. Uh, and that's really okay. the area where, where, where we focus. Good. 
So let's 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 move on to this you know, repair first ethos. And we know we've probably over the past few years we've definitely become in the body repair sector more focused on replacing parts than than repairing. And from your presentation, it, it's clear that profitability of a, of a of a collision shop, a body shop, is is driven by being able to sell more labour hours. Um, so how can we, what are the key things that, that you would say a body shop needs to do to move its thinking from thinking about replacement more to thinking about repair? I think uh, rather than have that necessarily at the, at the forefront, the, the, the key thing I would say for body shops is, is over the last 10, 15 years, as, as, as I said, the, the materials used and the technology used in the manufacturing of cars has evolved massively. But repair methods haven't actually necessarily kept pace with them. And so the net result is that we've kind of found ourselves starting to replace more and more panels, which actually with the, you know, the repair methods that we have available to us today would be repairable. But over that period of yeah. time, I think what's happened is, um, you know, we've, we've, we've become more conditioned to replacing parts. And actually, the skill mix or, or, or the technician skill set within our businesses has evolved um, in, in the same kind of way. So one of the things that I, I um, highlighted in the presentation is when you look at the overall damage mix in the majority of collision repair shops today, it's skewed. For, for obvious reasons, uh, towards non-structural uh, damage in, in large part to outer panels. But when you look at our uh, technician skill sets, they're actually skewed towards the, the, you know, the structural repair. So the thought process is that actually if you can, using modern repair methods and, and with the right knowledge and skills of, uh, of the technicians within your business, is actually a lot of panels that we're currently replacing are in scope with repair in in scope for repair per the OEM uh, repair procedure, and for those that are that we're able to repair, I, I would suggest that there is opportunity for shops to uh, improve uh, productivity and improve throughput uh, and, and by extension improve uh, gross margins. Okay, great. Um, one question for you, Dave, and I guess this is a bit, a bit of a conflict in, in my mind, is that you work closely with, with, with the OEMs um, and it's all about the repair procedure. It's all about quality of repair. Do we not have two opposing forces here where we're promoting repair, which is good for the body shop, it increases labour our, our sales. It's it, you know, it's probably more eco-friendly, but at the same time, we know that OEMs want to sell parts. They make a lot of profitability on parts. How do we manage that that sort of dichotomy? I think there's a couple of points there which are um, are, are worth thinking about. The first is that I think primarily the OEs are um, driven by consumer experience, uh, brand okay. experience, keeping that customer within uh, their brand, getting your recommendation or referral to other people to come into that brand. And, and that's about end-to-end -end services, you know, so whether or not that's, uh, the, you know, whether that's the, 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 the showroom experience or the service experience or the body shop experience, it's all part of the, you know, the overall. And central to that, um, is that you know a it should be a high quality repair but it should also be the most appropriate repair for the car so one of the things that you'll find um you know w within the, the you know the oe procedures is that they're that, you know they're calling for the least invasive form of repair and i i, I referred to this in the presentation so yeah um if you can uh, leave you, you know you can you can achieve the same quality standard by repairing or replacing that part then 
actually the, the second criteria is what's less invasive for the car, what's going to be the better quality repair, what's likely um, you know, to, to, um, to, to, to create a better outcome. And, and that could be uh, you know, retaining more of the original factory coatings, for example. It's not necessarily actually cutting off the quarter panel and, uh, and replacing with a new one. But, you know, if you think about the factory coatings, the more original coatings I have on the car, the, the better. So that's point one. The second point, I think, is there's a realisation on the part of uh, the OEs um, that they need to be competitive, in, in, in my opinion. And uh, so it's actually by doing the right thing and giving on the one hand, rather than just simply replacing, 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 when a part does need to be replaced, then I think the call for that to be one of their original parts has got a lot more resonance to it and credibility. So I think actually the, you know, in, in, in terms of in insurance companies on one hand and, and, and that kind of driving forces they're being, they're being given on one hand, on the other is actually, you know, I think reasonably, if we're going to replace a part, uh, kind of, you know, please be a, a, an original part and, and over the mix, what then happens from an OE perspective, is that they grow their market share of, of vehicles being repaired within their network, and on that basis, actually, overall parts sales goes up. Um, yeah. and, you know, there's, there's numerous examples where, where that's the case. So, although it seems to be contradictory to start with, actually, if you play it out, I, I don't believe it is contradictory. So you mentioned that, Dave, you mentioned insurance companies. So mm -hmm. one of the one of the things we hear is obviously doing a, a repair estimate and getting that approved by an insurance company is one of the key elements of a process. If we move more to repair rather than replace, and we know in the estimating products, um, the replacement times are OEM derived, but we know with repair times, they are far more subjective uh, and more opinion related. And we know that with insurers that triggers certain rules, checks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how can we convince insurers more to support a repair over replace uh, ethos? Well, I think as repairers, one of the things that we need to uh, demonstrate is 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 trust. Um, from the outset, and, and, and that means you know, that the, there's lots of different sort of aspects to that, but um, uh, you know, trust and a consistency of, a, of approach. And I think if you go back to those four key points in and around quality um, that I talked about in the, in, in the presentation, then actually there's quite an objective way of framing what the most appropriate repair method is. And if that's restorative repair, so we're going to straighten it up or we're going to repair a part, um, then um, we're supporting that uh, properly as, as repairers with, with evidence, um, uh, you know, to say why we've, we've reached that conclusion. Equally, if any one of those four quality criteria that I referred to is missed, um, we're actually building a very robust case for that uh, panel of part needing to be replaced. So, so for me, um, this is about getting to a point of, of, of being objective about what the most appropriate form of repair for that damage is and applying that consistently. Through that, we, we, we start to build trust. And I think, you know, to my mind, what insurance companies are really looking for, and we see it uh, happening, is, is, is to partner with body shops that are reliable, do good quality work, look after the customer properly, process the claim uh, and the repair quickly. Um, and, and, and and actually, in, in, in my experience, insurance companies don't have a problem paying for that. Yeah. So given this, this approach and this opportunity to improve a sort of a body shop's performance by taking on this sort of ethos, have you got, have you, could you share with us, Dave, some sort of tangible results and examples of, of body shops you've worked with and, or, or maybe OEMs that have taken on this approach that you're working with as BTAG and 
on what some of those results have shown? Yeah, so um, I mean, as a, as, a, as a business, we operate globally um, and, and we work with a number of the different car companies in, in different markets. Um, I think two examples that, that speak into this, and just you know, to be clear with repair first, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should be repairing everything or repairing the stuff which is not repairable. The, 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 the thought process here is for stuff which is within or, or, or panels or parts which are within scope for repair, let's repair them. And, and you know, there's a series of advantages that accrue as a result of that. So two real world examples of that. One is a project which is still ongoing very successfully um, in, in Europe, started in Switzerland, um it goes under a, a banner called clear car rep it's currently about 100 independent uh, repair shops a good quality of repair in switzerland high level of training in switzerland um and we've been doing that with axa insurance and the focus there has been actually to increase the repair percentage within that kind of non-structural small and mid-sized out of panel repair um, and 18 months, nearly two years in, results have been you know, incredibly positive. Repair uh, ratio is up. Average claim cost from an insurance point of view is down. Uh, customer satisfaction is up. Uh, and you touched on the, the environmental point. I've not actually thought about it, but for each bumper cover uh, that gets produced, um, apparently, um, you know, in terms of the CO2 that's produced during that process, yeah. it, it, it requires three trees to um, that's right. you know, to neutralize that. So, so, so there was a, an environmental point which was really important to uh, to access. Actually, um, another example, which is an OE example, is BMW in North America. So they uh, had a very innovative approach. They they've driven um, uh, an insurance partner program. So they've uh, reached out as a as a car company to um, the insurance companies in, in in the U.S. market, and what they've said is actually we are looking for ways to become more competitive for you uh, to, to to process these repairs, um, a, a in accordance with OEM standards, but as efficiently and quickly and um, with as high degree of customer satisfaction as possible. So that, again, that's a program that we've been involved with in, uh, in now for probably nearly five years. Um, in, in, again, it's been very successful. Uh, so, so as part of that program, you know, the, the, the training that we deliver sort of sits at the center of the uh, outer panel repair and car company, customer and insurance company are all um, feeling really good about the results on that and repairing. Yeah. So there's a lot of collaboration that needs to go on. You, you need to get all parties to really share the view for it to, to, to really be successful. And it sounds like you've been able to do that. Um, so Dave, one, one sort of final question to, to, to wrap up. Uh, it's been a fantastic, uh, really um, interesting discussion and some fantastic uh, information you've shared with us. One final question: You use the phrase "Where will the puck be?" which I guess is a, which I guess is a hockey a analogy. Yeah. Given what's happened in the last few months around the world, you know, where, where do you see, particularly focusing on collision repair, what 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 would you say to collision repairers now coming out of this? You know, some of them have been closed. We've seen them, even those that have made, remained open, that 90% of their business have, have disappeared during the pandemic. And they're really having to, to fight to bring that back. Uh, and they, they obviously need to do that, you know, being innovative and, and taking on all these new ideas and, and approaches. What would your final message be to, to collision repairers around the world based on what you've told us today? Like for, uh, for me, I, I, I would um, say is actually focus on doing the basic things well. Um, you know, car volume is, is down. Uh, early signs are that it's, you know, vehicle miles traveled is starting to pick up again, which, you know, direct correlation, that's good. Uh, our view is that 
um, car count is probably not going to get up to pre-pandemic levels for uh, quite some time. Uh, point number two, I would say, is, is, is really look at um, the repair mix within your shops and take the time to understand it. Uh, and then determine whether or not your skill mix is aligned with that. Uh, and I think the reason that's important is competition for repairable vehicles, in, in our opinion, is likely to increase. So uh, as, as average age of the car park pushes out a little bit, people defer making uh, new car purchases or find ways to extend terms on, on, on current uh, finance arrangements. Um, average age of car park goes up. Uh, so I think there are a number of forces that are, 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 are possibly going to be acting against us uh, in the industry over the next year or two. And, and, and actually what that means is we just have to become really, really good at what we do well, which is, which is fixing cars. Uh, yeah. So, so focus, in, in my opinion, on, on, on doing the basics well, making sure that technicians are, um, you know, are, are, are aligned or skill sets aligned with the, with the work mix. And if it's possible to fix it uh, in accordance with OE standards, fix it. I think, I think the, um, the commercial benefits are, uh, are, are there for those that do that. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. And obviously, you know, you've got a lot of knowledge uh, uh, personally and a, a lot of knowledge in, in the business at BTAG. So I guess anybody who wants to find out more, uh, they, how, how's the, how is it best to, for them to contact you? Always delighted to speak to anyone that wants to talk collision repair. Um, uh, you can go to our uh, website, either btagnorthamerica.com, uh, there's there's all of the contact forms there or uh, outside North America, btaginnovation.com. Um, and I, I guess through uh, through the team at IBIS, um, okay. always happy for you to share my details and we can have a conversation from there. Brilliant. Listen, thanks, Dave. I've really enjoyed uh, speaking to you today. Some uh, enlightening discussion and, and thanks for a, a really engaging presentation. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, Stay safe and well. Uh, bye. Thanks, Jason. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the latest instalment of Ibis Leading Lights with Dave Flockhart from BTAG. Please stay tuned for further updates and further presentations from Ibis Leading Lights. Thank you and goodbye.